everybody. Welcome to the New Market Alliance Church podcast. For more information on the vision, programs, and news of our church, be sure to check us out at www.newmarketalliance.ca. We'd like to encourage you as well that no podcast, no matter how good, can substitute for the experience of joining together in person at a worship celebration. That's where God really meets people, often through the love and ministry of others. At NAC, we meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Now let's join this week's teaching. This is the end of our Hot Topics series. And um, just as a way of, of introduction, I have in my house at 592 Dutch Elliot Court four women. So there is, um, yeah, it's a lot of uh, estrogen floating around in the room. And so you're going to think that's going to play a role in my interpretation of Scripture, and I hope that's not the case. Um, do you ever notice when they're on TV, if there's a talking head and, and an issue comes up about uh, female assault or, or, or the Me Too movement, uh, men will often say, look, I have three daughters, or you know, I was raised with four sisters, and the implication, therefore, is you know, I get it. I'm more qualified to speak on this issue. And I always think, you know, what does having uh, a female in your life qualify you to have compassion for an issue that, you know, everyone should have compassion for? Besides, all of you have a mom or a daughter or a sister or a friend who's female or a coworker. And uh, it's really God's feeling on women, the Bible's opinion on women that matters. It matters to me. And so I'm using this phrase, holy discontent, a lot lately. Um, and next week, we're going to begin a new series on holy discontent. It's this, it's this passion, this, this righteous anger that God gives us when something in the world doesn't seem right. And so I, I, I suppose I experienced some holy discontent around uh, this issue of how called and qualified women have sometimes been treated in the big C evangelical church. And I'll bet there's even some deep wounds, some spirit hurts in this room. Um, you know, sex, sexism, I think, is especially reprehensible when it's carried out in the name of biblical Christianity. For instance, here's some real things that I've witnessed or heard about in my Christian upbringing. Uh, one Sunday at a, at a church, a woman was scheduled to present the children's sermon in a climate where women weren't allowed to preach. And so at last minute, the bulletins had to be reprinted so that it was a children's lesson. And apparently that made all the difference. Uh, the, the inconsistencies can just be glaring. You know, in some churches, a woman couldn't speak unless unseen by men. I mean literally unseen, like behind a screen. Um, a woman could speak on the radio or be listened to on a tape, but not be seen in person. And that was like a way around the issue. I knew of one church where a woman um, could, speak, could, could speak in the evening service, but not in the morning service. Um, this one happens all the time where the female small groups pastor or children's pastor uh, gets a title change to um, small groups director. You seen that one? Sophie Mueller uh, went out as a missionary to Columbia in the late 1940s, and she started at least 500 churches, 500 and she'd been taught that a woman should keep silent in church. So she taught her converts outside. And when it rained, this pioneer missionary taught her students under a lean-to. Was that necessary? Uh, is the church a building? Is it not people? So I suppose it raises the question, who gets to decide what women do in the church? And the answer to that question, I hope we can all agree on, is God through the Spirit. He decides. And sometimes we get so wrapped up in our debates, we miss 
the origin of the call. You know, we don't decide what women do in the church. God does. And so while some denominations, some churches are asking questions, you know, our denomination was asking this question recently, should we ordain women or not? The question ought to be this one. What has God's Spirit gifted women to do? And I think the answer to that question is this. Whatever God's Spirit wants them to do. Uh, If you don't believe me, all you got to do is simply open your Bible and ask the question, what do women actually do in the Bible? You look at New Testament history. Remember when Peter got up to preach on the day of Pentecost, he said that this was a fulfillment of Joel's prophecy that when God poured forth his spirit on all humanity, sons and daughters and men and women would prophesy. That is, they would speak the mind of God, and they did. And then in the early church, women worked right alongside the men in spreading the gospel and planting churches. And in in many cases, it was a woman Uh, Lydia in Philippi, who who was the prime mover in in getting a church started and hosting it in her home. And there was other women like um, Priscilla, who taught theology. There was others like Phoebe, who served as as ministers or deacons. There was others who prophesied, like Philip's daughters. And you look at Romans 16 alone, you look at the numerous references to women in ministry in that chapter. Um, including Junia, a woman who's said to have shared prison time with Paul and was an apostle and an elder. You look in the Old Testament, Huldah was another woman through whom God brought renewal when Israel was at a spiritual crisis. And God had the king go to a woman for authoritative instruction. Deborah was a judge, the highest leader in Israel Um, She was married, but it was her, not her husband, who was chosen by God to lead his people. And also think of this. If she was leading all of Israel, who was one of the people that she was leading? Her husband. So if God is opposed to women in leadership, why would he do such a thing? Isaiah described his wife as a prophet. But in all things, most of all, we look to Jesus his words, his actions. What sort of example does Jesus set? Well, uh, Jesus pointed out to the men who were judging a woman caught in adultery that she was no more guilty than they were. Um, He received Mary's act of worship as being more meaningful than anything that was going on in the synagogues. He welcomed women into his inner circle of friends and disciples. Women were the last at the cross. They were the first at the tomb. Uh, Jesus appeared to women first following his resurrection and then gave them the joyful responsibility of informing the disciples of, of him being alive. You could say that women were the first ones to bring the good news of the gospel. And you notice how he, how he talks to women. No other so-called religious type would dare talk to. I think of the woman at the well, for instance. And I, I think it's also telling where Jesus chose to preach and teach. Um, didn't usually choose the temple. He, he, he looked at towns and, and villages, the countryside around the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, where there's no dividing walls of segregation. And even when Jesus did teach at the temple, it was, it was in the public areas, the outer courts where women were allowed. Jesus taught women in private settings. Uh, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, you know, it says that she sat at the feet of the Lord listening to what he said. You know, to sit at the feet of a teacher was an expression to show a formal mentoring relationship between a rabbi and a disciple. Jesus appointed women to leadership in the early church. Peter's mother-in-law, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary, the mother of James, Salome, Joanna, Susanna, Martha, sister of of Mary and Lazarus. You read the Gospels, and not in a single case is a woman um, denigrated, reproached, humiliated. You know, males, especially power-wielding males, are often scolded 
strongly scolded, but not women. And predictably, Jesus saw the unnoticeable women, the, the inconspicuous, silent sufferers. And these were the women relegated, it seems, to the fringes of society. And he showed them such respect, such dignity. I can't help but think, if young women today involved in you know, a form of militant feminism were shown how radical Jesus was, the way he treated women, maybe they'd find him as their savior and their source of justice that they seek. The impact of, of Jesus' life on gender I think can be summed up in Galatians 3, 27 to 28. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So it's still a debatable issue. There's uh, uh, two camps I suppose, two schools of thought. Now, there's this egalitarian position, we call it, is really how knack functions. It's the practice in which both uh, male and female can serve in any ministry calling. And the other camp uh, commonly goes by the label complementarian. Now, I'm going to be a bit of a, a rebel here, a bit of a contrarian. I'm going to use the term hier- hierarchical. Hier- <laughs> Maybe I should just go complementarianism. <laughs> hierarchalism, uh, patriarchal hierarchalism. <laughs> <laughs> to designate that view, uh, I'm aware they prefer to be called complementarians, maybe because it's such a mouthful. But, you know, that term was invented in the mid 80s to portray the position of, of holding that the men and women are complementary to one another. The problem is, though, is that egalitarians also believe that all believers, including men and women, are complementary to one another. So it's hard not for me to think that there was a bit of a branding decision that went on there to avoid calling attention to the essence of the position that men are in a hierarchical order over women. So, look, both positions are biblically defensible. Um, Frankly, at times, they're both biblically problematic. Uh, I may be preaching to the choir for some of you, and you're like, why are we even talking about this? For others, this may be an issue of uh, you're getting a little tense as you can sort of hear my opinion on this. Others of you are like, I'm new to church. I didn't even know that, that church is held Uh, different opinions on this. Um, I personally find it easier to defend the unresolved problems of egalitarianism than the problems of hierarchalism, problems that seem to me um, to be far more serious and, and even call into question the unity of the Bible. But look, many devout intelligent Christians are going to disagree with me on this. And one day, like, we'll all figure out to one degree or another where we veered from God's perfect wisdom in this issue and and many others. Until then, I'll just tell you, I'm going to hold this position humbly but firmly. It's it's one of the reasons I'm here at NAC um, and not at another church because of the position that you have held for many years here. And I'm willing to take the risk of encouraging women to do what I believe Scripture and the Spirit is calling them to do. So often, you know, the hierarchical position starts building a case right in Genesis, right right at the creation story. It says in Genesis 2.18, the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper. Hebrew word is azer, suitable for him. I don't know if anybody was like me. Did you grow up in the church thinking the word helper meant like uh, God made the woman to be kind of a junior assistant to the man? Like, you know, assistant to the regional manager, that sort of thing? (laughs) 
like the man had all this stuff he had to do. He had to name the animals, and, and God needed to make him a gopher to, like, pick up his dry cleaning and get him a double-double. And, like, someone lower down the org chart. Um, and then I learned that this word translated Azor, helper, is the same Hebrew word most often used in reference to God himself. Uh, for example, in Exodus 18, Jethro names his son Eliezer because my father's God was my helper, Azer. And then in Psalm 40, uh, as in many other places, the psalmist refers to God as my help, Azor, and my deliverer. The word Azer is translated in other places in scripture as rescuer, strength, deliverer, power. It, it's, a, it's a word used most often for God um, then clearly it does not mean somebody lower down the org chart, does it? And then I heard the argument that because man was made first and women second, it implies that man is superior. Okay, but the, the argument then has to work both ways. I mean, you could say that God made animals first and then made man you know, who was a step up from animals. And then God said, oh, I'm just warming up now. I'll create Eve. She'll be my highlight reel, right? So what makes more sense is that, is that there is no superiority one way or the other, that man and woman are equally created in the image of God. Then I hear this argument uh, that after sin enters the garden, God's consequences are your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So instead of understanding this and other, other aspects of what we call the curse as the natural consequences of human sin, you know, complementarians use this verse as a reinforcement of their patriarchal position. Like, you got to understand, domination by one gender over the other was not God's ideal. It's not something we were supposed to try and uphold. Rather, like other aspects of the curse, we were to work hard to overcome and know that Jesus himself would fully overcome as part of our redemption. So there's this hermeneutical principle. Hermeneutics is the, is the study of biblical interpretation, the art and science of, of biblical interpretation. It's not as easy as you might think. And, and, and the... The principle is this, when we come to a difficult passage, we, we have to interpret it in the light of the, of the broad, uh, repeated themes of the Bible. So one of the great themes of scripture is that at the heart of the gospel is a message of, of freedom and liberation for all who've been oppressed. And you don't have to look too far into history to see that women have been greatly oppressed. Like, do you realize there are more than 100 passages in the Bible that affirm women in roles of leadership and fewer than half a dozen that appear to be in opposition? So it begs the question, have certain tribes of Christians built an elaborate system of belief and practice on only a few debated passages? Passages that maybe have been lifted out of context, elevated to the point that they become, you know, more important than the overall message of the gospel. And so what even perplexes me more are those Christians who, who would champion a literal interpretation of scripture when it comes to women preaching and teaching, but then ignore what it says in the adjoining verses about, you know, like wearing gold wedding rings, for instance, um, there's another hypocrisy around this issue that I, I'll just tell you, it bothers me. I've noticed men have never seemed to object to women going off to difficult missionary assignments in the far corners of the earth. And the matter of women preachers usually becomes a problem only when uh, women want to be pastors back home. And so... It makes me wonder if there may be more than just chauvinism at work here. Like, could there even be racism at work here? Even if it's unconsciously so. Like, consider the possibility 
that there could be this unspoken hierarchy where white men can preach to anyone, but white women, you know, they're not free to preach to white men, they're assumed superiors, but they can preach to black men. And black men, given this hierarchy, are then able to speak down to black women. And black women who are at the bottom of this social ladder are not allowed to preach to anyone except other black women. And by the way, um, if women are not to teach men, just when does a boy become too old for a woman to legitimately continue to teach him? Like, you know, taken to its logical conclusion, do, do they mean that women couldn't toilet drain their son or teach him how to tie his shoes and brush his teeth? Like, would Vicky and, and Brittany and Melissa and Sydney um, not be allowed to lead a band if there's men in it? And, and for that matter, Jessica and Stephanie and Rosemary and Bonnie, should they ever be allowed to teach males in a public school setting? Like, relatively few hierarchalists will follow the implications of this argument to, you know, to its logical conclusion. Because it would reveal, I think, the cracks in the premise. You know, Billy Graham's daughter, Ann Graham Lotz, uh, there she is. If, if, you, if you ask preachers, um, it's recognized that she's the best preacher in the Graham family, in the Billy Graham family. And when she spoke at a 1988 pastor's conference, you know, several of those in attendance, as an act of protest, I suppose, turned their chairs around so they wouldn't face her. Yikes. And she's such a gracious lady. Anne doesn't try to convince people. You know what she said, though? When people have a problem with women in the ministry, they need to take it up with Jesus. He's the one who put us here. Yeah, like God is an equal opportunity employer. So so when faced with examples in Scripture of women leading in all kinds of ministry, um, the hierarchalist comes up with excuses that I've heard, like, well, it's because the men of that day didn't step up to the challenge, or women can prophesy, but they can't have the office of prophet, or women can teach, but not preach. Uh, women can preach, but only with the permission of their husband. You know, these, these explanations strike me as, as a bit of a desperate attempt to save the system, uh, to preserve the benefits of a male privilege that it's built upon. So it's no wonder that hierarchalists can't even uh, agree among themselves just what a woman may do or may not do and under what circumstances. Like, the only thing they agree on is that men are the ones who get to tell women what to do. And one of the suspicious translation issues is when the name Junia, uh, a female name, comes up. She had one of the highest offices in the early church, and early on her name was translated as Junius, a male name. Do you see that verse there, Leela? In fact, um, Junius is actually going to appear in some of your Bible translations, and um, it's hard not to think that some translators may have had an agenda and wanted to do a bit of revisionist history. What impression do you think women are left with when they're excluded from official ministry positions? I I can only imagine they're left feeling with this idea that something is wrong with them. Look, gender is no barrier to vocation. The Latin word is vocare. It it means vocation, but it also means your calling. We're called by God, each of us. We're part of this priesthood of believers. And thus, all of us have uh, the responsibility to use that which God has given us for his glory. Okay, so that being said, that's my introduction. Just kidding. I told you the hierarchical position was biblically defensible. Uh, Because there are some difficult verses to reckon with as an egalitarian. And I think one of the most difficult is from this book that we've been studying since forever, 1 Corinthians. Um, So let's put that up. This is from 
chapter 14, verse 34 or 35, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission even as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Now, I just want to show you a book. This is about six pounds, and uh, this is the main commentary that I've been uh, using, consulted, while I've studied 1 Corinthians. The book about 1 Corinthians, which is a few pages in your Bible, is bigger than the Bible itself, which is interesting. So I, I have known for a long time, if you want to know what the world-renowned expert on 1 Corinthians and Bible hermeneutics thinks, you should go to this dude, Gordon Fee. And the guy has given his life to the study of, of hermeneutics and this book in particular, 1 Corinthians. And what he says about these two verses um, is going to mess with some of your worldview here. Gordon Fee gives pages of evidence as to why it's obvious to him and to other scholars that these two verses are what's known as a gloss. What is a gloss? Uh, a gloss is a brief notation, uh, usually in the margin of the manuscript, um, not usually by the original author. It'd be like if a um, hundred years from now, if they found this message under the rubble of, of what used to be Knack, and they're reading this message, and in the top left corner, uh, Brittany has written in lipstick, uh, sweet chicken, uh, Glenn Robinson is so hot. <laughs> a good academic would go, well, that doesn't sound like Jonathan's writing style. Uh, it seems very random. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the message. Now, now, these verses aren't as egregiously obvious as that example, but Fee's belief is that someone felt the need in either the original letter or one of the early copies to kind of put their own spin, their own commentary in the margin. And that ends up getting copied and then grafted into the Bible. It wouldn't be the first time. There's, there's at least three other examples in Scripture where that has happened. Sometimes you'll run into a little asterisk in your Bible. It says something like, most reliable transcripts do not include this. Well, according to, to Gordon Fee, one of the giveaways, and, and there are a ton of them that we don't have time to get into, is that the phrase, even the law, even as the law says, well, uh, never does Paul refer to the law or the Old Testament as, as binding on Christians. But more to the point, the law doesn't actually say anything like this. It's also a dead giveaway that this verse stands in contradiction to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where women are prophesying and praying and speaking in church. Like if Paul had intended to prohibit women from public ministry, uh, I think he would have taken the time in chapter 11 to correct the manner of which they were doing that. But it was assumed in Paul's writing that women were speaking and prophesying in church. So Fee concludes that these aren't actually authentic verses. Now, this, this may be the most radical thing you've heard about the Bible because you believe it's infallible and errant and in supernatural. And so how does some dude writing commentary in the margin mean, does that mean the whole foundation of the Bible collapses on itself? No, no. Uh, and, and to you, I just want to say, if you're picturing the Bible as words you know, written by the finger of God onto paper and then immediately put to press, you got to realize there are human fingerprints all over this thing. You know, there are some minor copyist errors. There's some translation issues um, from dead languages, no less. The Bible is ancient and it's diverse and at times even a little ambiguous. And when we turn it into a a policy manual, you know? First of all, we turn it into something it was never meant to be. Um, 
It's a relatively modern concept to turn the Bible into a textbook of clarity uh, that, that offers sort of certainty on every issue apart from the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. I mean, sometimes the Bible doesn't even speak with unity, with one voice on every subject. But let's say you don't agree with, with Gordon Fee here, that the, the Corinthian uh, expert, um, that the verse actually is from Paul himself, I still think there's some things you need to consider. There's, there's interpretation issues. One of the first rules of biblical interpretation is before you apply scripture to 2019, you have to understand the context and the culture in which it was written, right? So, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 14, it says that a man is dishonored if he has long hair. Now, it, was this an absolute truth for all time, for all men everywhere? If so, like, can you explain God telling Samson to grow his hair long? 99% of theologians and reasonable people agree that Paul's instruction concerning hair length is an example of a relative statement in Scripture. Paul addressing an issue uh, of a specific time, a specific culture that we don't fully understand. You know, sometimes, sometimes Christians are more outraged by breaches of culture than disobedience to biblical absolutes. And uh, this is what Paul's telling the men of Corinth. If they had long hair, they're committing a, some sort of cultural blunder that's going to bring dishonor to Jesus. If Paul had been speaking to Christians in Thailand instead of Christians in ancient Corinth, he might have reminded them that, that crossing their legs and leaving one foot pointing at another individual would bring dishonor to Jesus, you know? Whenever man has attempted to make relative truths into biblical absolutes, the result is always legalism. And the opposite danger occurs, though, when people take absolute truths and change them to sort of fit our culture and times. And we don't want to do either. So, so how do we know which statements in the Bible are absolute and which statements are relative to a particular time and place? Well, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would guide us in all truth. Does, does a verse of the Bible seem to make God unjust, unwise, unloving? Uh, well, we know all of Scripture contradicts that, so the problem might be in our interpretation. God and His Word are infallible. Our interpretation of His Word, not so much. So you know what absolute is never contradicted in all of Scripture? Equality. Not just equality between men and women, but equality between all people of every race, of every background, between the haves and the have-nots, everyone. So in terms of this being a relative or cultural interpretation, here's a theory. Um, social historians tell us that these freshly uh, converted women Christians who have discovered equality in Christ may have um, exaggerated uh, its usage in public settings. Like, they often may have used the opportunity to suddenly speak in assemblies of fellow believers in a way that was disruptive. That's one theory. Other theories um, that given the almost universal sexism of the first century, the preaching and leadership of women might have actually been so scandalous, so detrimental to the preaching of the gospel um, that it was forbidden for that time, for that place. And so theologians like John Stackhouse concludes that Paul may have temporarily uh, given this accommodation of Christianity to the patriarchy of the time because nothing is more important than advancing the gospel. Women teachers in that time, in that place, would have likely interfered with the gospel purpose. But what about the church in our culture Today, Stackhouse concludes that today we face exactly the opposite problem in our country and other countries like ours. Um, in other words, the exclusion of women 
is what is scandalous and embarrassing and actually impeding the advancement of the gospel in our country. You know, I've seen women who have rejected Christianity because their perception is that the church views women as second-class citizens. I mean, what could be further from the heart of Christ? Can you, can you think of even one conservative Christian who thinks that the subordination of slaves still applies today? And yet, those same Christians somehow are able to insist on the enduring application of the female subordination texts that actually come from the same neighborhood as the slave texts in the Bible. And speaking of experts, probably the most renowned, respected expert on all things Paul the Apostles, a guy's name, F.F. Bruce. And he says this about difficult Pauline passages like this. He says, in general... Uh, where there are divided opinions about the interpretation of a Pauline passage, that interpretation which runs along the lines of liberty is much more likely to be true to Paul's intention than one which smacks of bondage or legalism. Look, um, the Bible makes it clear that we don't choose who will be given what gifts. And we aren't in the business of filling quotas either, wherein you know, say we'd survey the church uh, membership and find out that 60% are women, then we have to make sure that 60% of our leaders are women. Look, it's God who chooses the gift. We know from the master's parable that gifts that are imparted are not to be buried. And as a pastor, um, I've realized I could be the one potentially bearing the gift of hundreds of women. And so for the sake of the gospel, every gift is needed and no treasure can be buried. It can't be, we can't afford it. And so I want to be clear, this is, this is not some modern accommodation to culture. You know, when Justin Trudeau was elected and he appointed a record number of women to his cabinet, he was asked about his reasons for the decision. Do you remember what he said? Because it's 2014, Right? Well, that's not what this is about. This is not about, like, changing with the times. In fact, if you look at some church history, Charles Finney, do you have that picture of, yeah, he was the Billy Graham of his time. He wanted, he wanted women to be able to actualize their God-given potential in business and church and society. So here's what he'd do. When, 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 when people would commit themselves to Christ, Finney wanted to know whether they would join either the anti-slavery movement or the newly emerging feminist movement. I, I think it's odd that um, feminists and some leading evangelicals often stand in like diametrical opposition to each other because it was the evangelical Christian community that gave the feminist movement its original impetus. And historians say that in most spiritual awakenings, it's women who are the accepted ministers in the early stages. And unfortunately, later as the revival excitement sort of cools into organizational structures, then the women are sort of squeezed out. Um, the Wesley brothers uh, had a remarkable godly mother named Susanna. Miss Wesley uh, preached to more than 200 people every week in prayer meetings. It's no wonder her son John used women leaders in, in his small groups which spread revival so effectively. D.L. Moody, uh, the Alliance's own A.B. Simpson, William Booth of the Salvation Army, who said, some of my best men are women. I mean, that was a radical statement at the time. Women missionaries were the first to translate the Bible for hundreds of language groups, and they did it in the most rugged, remote places, you know, as one writer put it, the more difficult and dangerous the work, the higher the ratio of women to men. Twice as many women as men ventured into China as missionaries. And today, 40,000 of the 50,000 house churches are led by women. In closing, let me just, I mean, if I haven't offended you yet, uh, I'm about to. Because I want to just drop a conspiracy theory on you that I've been thinking about. What if the suppression of women's ministry gifts are actually a ploy of the enemy of our souls to keep more than half 
of the Christian workforce from fully using the gifts God has given women for the benefit of the church. Like, the devil knows his time is limited. He's doing everything he can to impede the work of the Great Commission. What if one of the tactics is to simply cut the number of workers in half? Two-thirds of all Bible-believing Christians worldwide are women. So when two-thirds of the Christian army are excluded from leadership work, the loss for God's cause is, is so great it can hardly even be quantified. And the enemy appeals to the pride of men like me, saying, yeah, sure, everybody's equal. We're just a little more equal. Have you heard of Young Yi Cho in South Korea, pastor of the largest church by far. I mean, there's not even a close second. He visited a certain country where the work of God had struggled for many years, just faced opposition after opposition. And he said, all the churches were ineffective and floundering, and all of them happened to be holding back their women. And he goes on to say, I told them, release their women. But they kept insisting that's not the problem. But they still kept asking me, oh, Dr. Cho, what's the key to your church? I tell them, release your women. But they just don't hear me. God's given this man the largest church on earth to pastor. He has 700 senior pastors on his staff, (laughs) including many women. He also has 30,000 small groups. I don't mean 30,000 people in small groups. I mean 30,000 small groups. And we have some openings in a few of ours as well. Um, Do you think God might be trying to tell us something? I just, I want to say to the women this morning, thou art loosed. You are free. Can Can I pray for you? Would you be bold enough to just, if you are female, would you just stand and allow me to bless you and pray for you? I'm going to invite the team to come on up. And, and men, just, just join me in spirit, at least, as, as we bless you. Young, old, everybody, if you are able to stand. God, I pray um, that love will rise in these women through you. I pray, woman of God, that you would be satisfied by love, that you would make your home in love, that you would make love your discipline, your resting place, your practice, your doctrine, your identity. May you be tireless in your pursuit of love, but but may you know how to rest well. I pray that you would be the voice of truth and boldness, I pray for you to be a woman of possibility and hope, a woman that rises above cynicism and bitterness. And and may you be alongside other women who invite you to go deeper, who make you more real, more honest, who who know the, the you without makeup and masks. I pray for opportunities to do the work that you love, and I pray for equal pay when you do it. And I pray that the women of your lineage of faith will inspire you. May you know the stories in scripture and in history and in your own circles. Um, We call out the sins of violence and rape and abuse against all women. No more. The forced um, prostitution, the sex traffic, and all the countless ways that the image of God in women is abused and mistreated and diminished. We call it out for what it is, sin and powers and principalities, systemic evil, injustice. We cast it down in the name of Jesus. And may you be a woman who is safe, a woman who does not fear. I pray that the places where this world has broken you, where evil has left its mark where you have felt abandoned and hurt, where you are in pain, would become a wellspring of healing and wholeness for you. I pray for the desert to bloom with flowers. I pray for your healing, sister. 
And I pray for your wholeness. I pray for your boldness. I pray for your voice to rise. May you witness a new thing brewing. Hear me, O woman of God. You have not been called to the people-pleasing life, to the approval-seeking life, to the bow down and give up life or the sit down and shut up life. You've been called to the truth-telling life, the mighty in words and deed life, the fearless life, the she who the sun sets free is free indeed life. You have been called to the spirit-filled and God-breathed life. So may you live out the ways of Jesus into every corner of your womanhood. Stop holding your breath, hiding your gifts, ducking your head, dulling your roar, distracting your soul, quieting your voice, and satisfying your hunger with the lesser things in the world. God, I pray that you would remember the truth of who you are, woman of God, that you would know you are valuable, you are loved. You are worthy, not because of what you do or what you say or what you accomplish, not because of how men perceive you or desire you, not because of how you look or dress, not because of your income, not because of whether you are or are not a mother, but simply because you are made in the Imago Dei, the image of God. And all men and women who agree with me say, Amen. Amen. Will you all stand? I've been really challenged by this series, and I've been asking God, well, what does he want me to do to change? And a word that he spoke to me this week was respect. And it starts with respect for him. I think sometimes the Bible might use the word fear there, but a a respect for God. And respect for each other. And a respect for our neighbors. And practically what that that means to me, and and I'm not there. So um, it could be being quick to to listen and slow to speak. not coming with preconceived ideas, but just just being open to the Holy Spirit wanting to change us. It can mean not just being involved in gossip, but actually shutting that down. It can mean laying my life down for my wife and my kids, not lording it over them. And so, Father, I just... I just ask that you would help us to treat each other with more respect. Amen.